Monkey is swallowing. Snake says swallowing. Next, a swallow too will fly and come and swallow. You ever swallow in a hollow galu. Making a whole lot of halabalu. Jale kalu. We know say you chop the money some, so give me the loot. Do you really want a revolution or just your turn? Cause if you really want a revolution, all this for Ben. Oh, you won't shut out the rig, the system to forever fail us. Hello, my name is Yemisi Adeoke. Welcome to Ake Arts and Book Festival 2020 online. I'll be moderating this panel discussion on Africa's isms with Diana Yakini, Sarah Jane King and Alea Kassam. Hope you ladies are all doing well. Um, if you wouldn't mind giving us a quick introduction, let's start with you, Sarah Jane. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah Jane Makwala King and I'm a journalist and author uh, currently based in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, I'm a radio presenter for Cape Talk uh, and my debut book was uh, released in 2017. It's called Killing Caroline and it's a memoir about um, transracial adoption and I'm currently working on my second book. Fantastic. Alea? Hi everyone. I am Alea Kassam. Um, from Nairobi, Kenya. I am a writer, a storyteller, a performing artist, and part of a founding member of the Lamb Sisterhood. Um, and we uh, write stories to fill the world um, and make African women feel seen, heard, loved, and beloved. Fantastic. Diana. Hi there, my name is Diana Yakini. I'm an actress, British Nigerian. I'm based in the UK. I'm a creator and a storyteller. Fantastic, so welcome everyone. Thank you for that, ladies. Uh, let's get right into it. So um, this year we've seen a big outpouring of emotion when it comes to the topic of racism. There's a lot that's been happening all over the world and much of this has been triggered by instances of pretty, uh, police brutality in the US. Uh, the big surge in support for the Black Lives Matter movement We've seen support all over the continent, solidarity marches in Ghana, Kenya, South Africa, you know, African leaders condemned George, uh, George Floyd's murder and so on. Were you guys surprised that this sort of message resonated so much with Africans on the continent? Let's start with Alea. Not at all. I mean, I think, I think um, there's always been a tradition of solidarity um, in diaspora, across the continent, across the ocean. Um, I actually, I, you know, when all of this was happening, I felt incredibly robbed that the, our education system deprived us of the sorts of thinking that enabled these movements to arise, you know, in the States. I thought, why the hell wasn't I reading Angela Davis in secondary school? Um, why wasn't I reading Franz Fanon? Why wasn't I, you know, why was I reading freaking Richard III? And so, in a way, you know, this connectivity that we have, the social media, you know, it energizes. There's a way in which um, freedom dreams are infectious. And so, it, it wasn't surprising. It, there's, there's, there's grief, and of course, there's there's a woundedness and there's also an energy that is so powerful. Not at all. Um, and I think that the way that the narrative made its way to South Africa and the way that it was dealt with here was very typical of a, of a South African response to, to issues, which is that it was very divided between um, black and non-black people in terms of how that movement was received and 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 those in those specific incidents um so that to me was interesting and slightly disheartening um and there was a there's a there's a disconnect in in understanding as to why yes these incidents are taking place outside overseas and of course they're, they're happening here we've got our own issues here in south africa but they're happening overseas but there's this there's this disconnect as to why um non-black people non-black people's understanding of why we as black people feel solidarity 
So yeah, wasn't mm. wasn't surprised. wasn't surprised at all, but was disheart disheartened by the the continued lack of understanding of that. And, it, and it's so interesting what um, Alea was saying in terms of you know why what the why were we reading certain things at school and why weren't we reading books that were relevant that were actually relevant um and and it made me think you know the the i've i was i was born in south africa but i grew up in england and the incidents and i grew up with um my brother we grew up in a very white sort of middle class part of part of um england in in surrey and the number of times that he as a young black man would get stopped walking to our house by the local police and the instances of I remember one time we'd forgotten our keys and so and my mom used to hide them like under the flower pot and my brother jumped over the fence to get into our garden and within 10 minutes three police cars had turned up um, to inquire why it was that two young black children well, I suppose we were probably maybe 13 and 11 at the time were breaking into this house and it wasn't until my mother returned home an hour later that they let us out the back of their their respective police cars what one in each and it just yeah to answer your question no not surprised Diana no I completely agree with um Sarah and Leia, not surprised at all. People are exhausted, they're tired. I think you're just waiting for a moment to where you can actually just also chime in. So that moment came and everyone just really, for lack of a better word, gave zero, you know, and said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. I have to be a part of it. You're exhausted, incredibly fatigued, having to just say nothing. And it, it, I know some people felt a bit weird because it wasn't happening here in your direct country or directly to you, but it all comes back to you. Whether it affects you financially, spiritually, emotionally, you will, if you end up marrying an American or somehow it comes back on you. So really the answer is just to know that we're in this together. When it's bad, it's bad. When it's good, it's good. But it's really together. So I think there's some, like, thank you all for your, for your thoughts there. I just wanted to pick up on something that Sarah Jane said about there being this sort of lack of understanding. Some people might think, well, Africa can't really have a racism problem when we're, you know, people on the continent, it's a predominantly black continent. So what is our sort of understanding of racism when, you know, most of the people that we interact with, that we that we deal with look like us? And obviously we know that that isn't necessarily the case, but I mean, how serious do you think Africa's race problem is? I mean, I know, I mean, the good thing is with you guys, you're all in different parts of the continent, so you can all speak to that. I know Sarah Jane, you know, in your very, very powerful memoir, you speak about the sort of direct impact that uh, the racism of apartheid had on your life. Um, and, I mean, what would you say is the situation in, in South Africa now? Yeah. You know, uh... You know, as somebody who who was born here and grew up in the UK and then returned here, my understanding and the and very much the narrative that I was given growing up as a as a child and probably a teenager, um, once um, once democracy um, sort of post nineteen ninety four, there was very much an idea that. And I and I wonder if this is still the case in, in England that well it's past you know apartheid's over so what's the problem? Um, and race impacts every race and racism impacts every aspect of life continues to impact every aspect of life in in South Africa. If you are a if you are a black person and also if you are a non-black person, but if you are a non-black person, you have the power and the privilege for it to not affect you in the same ways that it would affect a black person. Um, the, we're almost seeing, I think, a return to the levels of anger, of black anger, um, that we were seeing during the height of apartheid. Um, because we're now 25 years plus into democracy and very little has really changed for the majority of South Africans. And I think for me, what was so interesting was my experiences of racism in the UK as a black person were as a minority. And that's one thing. And, and you, it's not that you accept it because you're a minority, but, but that label is very much given. You know, we talk about black and, and ethnic minorities. 
when I came back to South Africa and I was no longer the minority, it required that I then explore really what racism meant and, and what it means in a completely different context because it was no longer about. It, it, it required me to, to explore for myself what my definition of racism was. And I came to understand that it was power plus privilege. It wasn't about minority or majority. Alea, I read an article that you wrote that discussed the issue of anti-blackness uh, within the Indian community. And there's a quote that I found that was, was really interesting. Um, it says, along with afternoon tea, they, uh, the colonialists, left us with the unshakable belief that white is superior. Um, why do you think that this is still the case? Despite, I mean, in Kenya and in, in India, you know, colonialists left a long time, you know, a long time ago compared to somewhere like South Africa. So why do you think that this notion that white is right and black and brown are, are somehow less, why is that so persistent? You know, um, Kenya was a, is, was a settler colony. And I think the contours of a settler colony are very specific. The rigidity of that hierarchy is, is put into place. I mean, Sarah put it so perfectly, you know, privilege and, and power. And this year, what, you know, along, alongside the Black Lives Matters movement was also a confrontation for a lot of people within my community to really think about what role we play in this racial hierarchy and also in our racist attitudes and beliefs and in perpetuating this, this, this structure. When we, you know, if you, look at, if you look at the Kenyans of Indian heritage who came down, um, we, there was a very strict, uh, you were, there was a very strict uh, demarcation of what you were allowed to do, what you had access to. And so this creation of, of hierarchy was very deliberate. Um, in fact, it, you know, there, if you look at, there's the Devonshire Declaration um, from 1919 that actually says that, you know, it, it says the Indians um, are dirty, they're filthy, they're unhygienic, they, deserve, they need to be kept in a very specific area and should not be allowed to mix. Um, and so what happened is that there was this, it's almost like we were only allowed to be in certain boxes. Then what happened is we became complicit in, in perpetuating that. And that's where I think the deep wound is that needs examining for me. Because, and I think that's, that, that is also kind of where tribalism really started to gain root, is this system of power and privilege that was set in place as racism, then took form in tribalism, now takes form in classism. It's that same hierarchical structure that oppresses and extracts and, and is so um, amorphous, like it, it shifts and changes and you can find yourself perpetuating it. Um, and of course, because our education system um, never teaches you this, you know, you don't, you, you can spend your whole life with no sense of really what it is that you are part of. Um, I don't know if that answered your, your question. No, yeah, yeah. Just to touch on the, the point that you made about tribalism, um, Diana, I know that you're now living in the UK, but you were previously based in Nigeria, which is the largest black nation on earth, but we still heard stories of racism and discrimination uh, against black people in Nigeria. Um, but tribalism is also a bigger issue. Some people might say that on the continent, it's more an issue of tribalism as opposed to racism. What would, what would you say to that? I think they are two big things that are happening at the same time. I don't think one trumps the other. Um, I'm Yoruba and I know the years I spent, I lived in Nigeria for about five years, born and raised in London, then moved to a couple of different countries, but I ended up in Nigeria. And I knew that people were very patriotic to their tribes. And I think that's great. But I didn't know it was at the, um, the hate or the detriment of others. So I didn't realize how much, maybe the country, maybe the people, the world, again, 
colonization, they pit us against each other. You know, Igbo people against Yoruba people, even just in terms of, you know, intertribal marriages. I witnessed so many people that were from two different tribes trying to get married and it seemed like World War II. Like it wasn't that big of a deal. We're all from the same country. So I definitely struggled with that when I was there and I'm a free bird. I'm from London, I'm from South, everyone, it's all good. But I just didn't understand how we're all from the same country. Like last, last, if it came down to it, it would be us as Nigerians against whoever. It wouldn't be, you know, I recently was in, um, I was in a play called Three Sisters at the National and it was about the Biafra war. And I was just blown away with how much information I acquired whilst doing that show. And I can see where we, where that started from, how they separated us. We were never meant to all be one apparently. But now that we are, let's make it work. Because you there's no going back. And I think that's the problem I, I find is we keep, it's just so much regression. Like we have to move forward with it. We understand the situa situation that we were put in that was out of our control. But now that we have that, I think unity is what's lacking. So when it comes to racism and tribalism, there's just so much going on. We kind of can't even pick one to focus on and fix it. So I don't know how, I don't know the way forward. I just know we need to then just more unity is, is needed. Don't know if that so answers your question. To, just to touch on what you said about fixing it. I mean, Sarah, I think Sarah Jane, who mentioned uh, the types of books that we're reading. Why aren't we, or sorry, it was a layer mentioning the types of books that we're reading. Why are we reading, you know, Richard III instead of reading Franz Fanon? Do you think it's an educational issue or where do we start to try to unpack some of these issues? Oh, that's, it's definitely the books you read. What you ingest, therefore, depicts what you do in life and how you behave and how you move. But I think you have to want to also inform yourself. Mm -hmm. I think when you're younger, education is forced upon you. When you are older, it's a choice. So when we start choosing to want to be educated in that manner, when we start choosing to want to know more, do better and be more, then I think the change can happen. But it's a lot of people, like, we're too old. It's like that whole, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Is that the, the phrase? And I'm, and I'm not calling it an old dog, but our legs a bit then I don't know just saying <laughs> Aleo what are your thoughts in terms of how we're how can we try to unpack these issues regarding racism and, and moving forward um you know I I read something by Mariam Kaba the other day that really like spun my head around um and if it, if you're if I could ask your permission to quote it because it's so powerful. Um, and she says, I believe that when we're in relationship with each other, we influence each other. What matters most to me as the un is the unit of interest in relationships. And it really struck me about relationships because we've been kept away from each other and so we don't know each other in certain ways. You know, um, we've been physically kept away from each other as races, as tribes, as ethnicities. Um, in, some t in some ways, we're not allowed to love each other. We're not allowed to eat. We, we, don't, we don't, even the food that we share, um, you know, hasn't um, had necessarily the freedom of, mov of movement um, that, that enables those relationships. And so I, I think we've got to learn each other. And the way we learn each other is through stories. I mean, that's where um, and, and learn each other in the textures of our lives. You know, learn each other in, the, in, in each other's intimacies. Um, in, let each other in, be vulnerable. Um, we, don't, we, don't, uh, we don't come out and we don't let anybody in. Um, and so of course we other each other all the freaking time. And if we do that, all we're doing is, is, is marking those lines harder and harder and making it easier and easier to um, for this, for this racist system to just perpetuate, and even this tribalist system to just perpetuate. So what we're doing here is, is a great example for the sorts of things, the sorts of tangible things that can be done to start, to start the long, slow change. Sarah Jane? When you look at spatial planning and apartheid spatial planning, it exists 
so clearly today. So it's no, you know, there's 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 a narrative that exists in South Africa um, from rather unfortunate non-black people, which is, well, why don't they just get over apartheid? And you only need to look at the way that the country remains in terms of its um, in terms of space to see that apartheid isn't over. It might not be legislated for in the way that it was. It might not be part of our our, our legal system and, and and government, but pretty much everything else for the majority of South Africans remains the same. Uh, Non-black people um, live in positions of privilege and power, and a black majority doesn't. Um, and so this idea where we are getting to know each other is is crucial. But again, it comes down to willingness. And I think it, there's a lot of talk around, and we talk very loosely about getting to know each other. But what that means in in a real sense is discomfort. It's not going to be a comfortable getting to know each other. It doesn't mean being able to say molo to your domestic worker and knowing the name that she was given at birth and not the name that you've chosen to give her because you can't pronounce her Kosa name or her Zulu name or whatever. It means it's a getting to know each other in any sort of friendship and relationship that is going to have ups and it's gonna have downs and there's gonna be awkwardness to say to make a commitment to knowing one another that commitment has to be made with an understanding that there's going to be some discomfort um and i think that is where we're stuck uh because people don't like to feel uncomfortable and i think also to speak to the the idea of privilege my own opinion is that is that it that will come also a relinquishment of some of that privilege has to be part of the getting to know. Otherwise, it's it's nothing. It's it's hanging on to something. Um, and I think in that um, there is th therein lies the difficulty because yeah. whenever you are in a position position of privilege, whether that be um, uh, racial privilege, monetary pri financial privilege, whatever, nobody yeah. nobody likes to let go of that. Nobody yeah. likes to let go of that, and nobody mm -hmm. likes to feel uncomfortable. So we we sort of find ourselves as a, at a stalemate. Um, we make a lot of the right noises and we say a lot of the, the right things um, and it sounds very kumbaya and everyone talks about the idea of the Rainbow Nation but nobody really, um, no, let me not say nobody, white people don't want to do the work. Hmm. So uh, just to touch on something that you said earlier, um, Sarah Jane, you mentioned the level of anger that um, is, is apparent in South Africa at the moment that it's it's creeping up. And that seems to be the case all over the world. Um, and you mentioned the power of anger in your book, uh, Killing Caroline, which I would recommend that you read if you haven't, it's a fantastic memoir. Um, do you think that anger in this situation, anger about racism is a powerful sort of tool to help deconstruct some of these structures that we're talking about? Do you think that anger can actually be of use here? The thing with anger also is that you can't rush anger. You can't rush anger. And and also when when a person, when one doesn't feel heard, one's anger increases, you become more angry. Mm. So when you have a situation where you are where you have a, a group of people who are saying, We are we are angry. And and my belief again is that at the root of all anger is hurt. When you have a group of people saying we are angry slash we are hurt and the response to that is not our problem it happened so long ago then that becomes unhelpful um i think there is a place for anger i think there is a that there, there is a place for anger but i'm not sure <sighs> when you talk about it relationally i i don't know i don't know how that how that then works because it it's almost a sense of there are two people that need to come to, to need to come to a, 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 a come to the party, um, but each doesn't really know how to communicate with one another. Um, do, yeah, anger. I, I, my my honest answer is I, I don't know. Yes, I think yes, I think there's a place for it. I think a lot of you know if you, even if you just look at the history of South Africa and you look at the um, you look at movements that have affected change they've been based on anger they've been based on we are angry that we are treated in this way um 
anger was at the root of a lot of movements and it continues to be um you know uh, a young uh, a young renegade by the name of julius malema decided that he was angry and he was going to set up a party um and he's now created a, a quite substantial opposition in 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 our parliament um based on and people to call him a very angry young man i don't know if he is a very angry young man but the root of a lot of his politics is based in justified anger i think anger at the way um that certain groups of people continue have been historically and continue to be treated um yeah i absolutely think there's a place for anger i suppose then that the follow-on from that is how is that anger channeled what mm. what it what manifests as a result of that anger and that's i suppose that's another question isn't it alea i saw you nodding are you in agreement with sarah jane no you know it's funny in kenya the the question that's often asked is um why aren't we angry enough? Like, when yeah. are Kenyans going to get angry enough? You know, and I was just thinking about, maybe it's just the moment that I'm in right now here where, you know, it's um, it's sort of, you, you live in this, in, this, in this state of, like, you know, a thousand micro oppressions. Also, like, anger means that there's hope, right? And I think that's the thing that I feel we need m more than anger is a sense of hope. Like, I feel like we've lost our sense of hope. At one point, we were the most optimistic nation in the world. Like, we thought we're going to get rid of our dictator, okay, and then everything's going to be fine. And of course, it was not fine. And then we got really angry at, you know, in, in 2007 and 2008, and, and, and everything just went poof. And we thought, okay, that'll do it. And it didn't do it. You know, and now, now I don't know. I think we need freedom dreams. I think we've forgotten how to dream. You know, um, I think we need to feel like oh, there's something possible that's different and that's better. That's that's better. There's got to be better. That dream is the thing. The dreaming is the thing I think we really need in Kenya specifically. Diana. Anger or dreams or a mix of both? Sarah said something. She said justified anger. We're a people who have had our emotions and our feelings micromanaged for a lifetime. So if someone is angry genuinely, why can't they express that emotion? I think you have a whole separate group of people, white people specifically, who if they're angry for something as small as just a bad day, it cannot be taken out of context and be seen as this grandiose thing. We're angry for a bad day and it's you're an evil human being. So we're angry for a reason that is justified for once and they and people still want to kind of curb that. Mm. So I think it's just a moment like, are we allowed to just really sit in the honesty of this anger? Because it's, it's very, very, very real and relevant and honest. So, I have to say, this anger is justified, therefore it's allowed. And dreams is always necessary. You never stop dreaming. But that anger, it has to be addressed. And maybe if it's finally addressed, it, we won't go back there. It's just, it's the same anger that's never addressed. I'm angry about the same thing and no one ever says sorry or why are you angry? So did the anger ever go away? Okay. Um. So some people have suggested, and I would love to get all your perspectives on this, uh, that the racism in the West um, kind of shows that as black people or as people of color, you know, it's never gonna change. And what needs to happen is that, you know, black people need to divest from the West and come back home. And, you know, this, uh, Diana, I see you inhaling and exhaling there, but, you know, some people are now pushing this Pan-African dream. It's time for everyone, you know, you can had your experience in the diaspora but you know come home what are your thoughts on this Diana I'm going to start with you because I saw that sigh I saw that deep breath you know what I'm going to be 100% honest here <laughs> there are there are some perks to living in a society that is has a certain standard of, of of rules regulations and law and structure and order I hear the point that is being made that says go back to the west go back to Nigeria go back to Africa put your money there, invest your time, invest, invest, invest. The truth of the matter is, until I feel invested in, I can't invest back. 
So I think as a people, if we're not investing into ourselves, I'm not going anywhere near there. And if I do, I'm going with the mindset that I don't feel safe here and not because I'm scared, but it's because there is no unity. Why would I go somewhere that is not trying to accept me for who I am and what I bring? And this goes back to us just being separated mm -hmm. as a people. We keep, keep flogging each other. There is a lot of money to be made, improvements to be made, and just overall greatness to be had in Africa. But Africans in Africa have to change the mentality and try to really come together. There's just the unity for me. I think everyone is really quick to try and, um, this is gonna sound so wrong, sell each other out. There is just a get rich quick scheme and it's not even necessarily a finance thing. It's just, I want to be more and I get the need to be more, but the ways that people go about it, I think if there was more order structure, I would be inclined to definitely be back Again, I moved to Nigeria five years, I think, is a long time for someone who wasn't born and raised somewhere. And in those five years, I witnessed a lot. And for me, my take home was I have to feel invested in to invest. And that doesn't necessarily mean money. That could just mean how we care for each other, how we talk to each other, how we treat each other, how we love on each other. One thing about Africa is community. It's a big community and we're all there for each other, but we have, that has to be more than verbal, has to be felt. So when that is felt, I think people will be more inclined to go back and get the Pan-African dream, bring back the money they're making in the sterlings and the dollars and whatever nationality, in whatever um, denominations. So yeah, I don't know. That's just how I feel. Sarah Jane, I'd love to get your thoughts on this as someone who did decide to relocate to to south africa um do you think that this whole pan-african dream is just is too simplistic a solution to the challenges we're facing absolutely it's such a it's such a it's so reductive to just to just to say that and i think i think very often the people that say that are people that um are uh, don't really have a clue and and i and i get it i i i get <laughs> oh dear i get I get the idea. I get the idea of um, we're treated so badly here. Let's go back to the homeland. But but the truth is, in my humble opinion, for the majority of people, we need to we need to be a little bit more realistic about what we talk about when we talk about the homeland. Because for for a lot of people, it's not the homeland. It it isn't. Um, it's more about not feeling not feeling at home in your home. Um, my, my, my situation sli is slightly different, I guess, because, you know, I, I was born in South Africa. I am South African. I just, ha because of apartheid, I was, you know, I was, you know, to steal Trevor's words, like born a crime. And so I couldn't exist here in my, in my, you know, abomination of self as the product of a, of a white and black union. Um, so when I came back to South Africa, it it was it it was home. I think also if people think that returning to South returning to Africa means that they are going to lose all of the issues and and problems that they are experiencing in in wherever in the in the diaspora, um, they're kidding themselves. Because uh, particularly if, if South Africa is where people are headed, because if you want to come, if you're trying to escape racism, South Africa is probably the last place that you want to go, come back to. Uh, because because the racism that I experience in South Africa is unlike anything I experienced in my 20 years uh, as a black person of mixed race living in in Surrey. So that uh, just to give it a kind of context of that, it's a very different beast. That's not to say that what I experienced in the UK wasn't atrocious and insidious and awful, but it's a completely different beast. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I think also to do that, to, to do this kind of um, let's all go back to the homeland, it's not tackling the issue. It's almost like it's almost uh, running away from from a big from from the problem, the root of the problem. Um, yeah, I, I, it's not an idea that I think is particularly useful. I understand why people 
want to do. I understand the compelling reasons why people feel that. Um, and I think it all boils down to again, and I think I think so much of what we experience broadly can be can be kind of taken down to really base human emotions. We want to belong. We want to be seen as all humans want to be seen and validated and want to belong. And when your life and your lived experience is that in the place that you call home, you are not validated, you are not seen as worthy of respect or dignity, um, you can't feel safe you can't feel that you belong in that in that in that context so i get it but i don't think everyone jumping back on the on the boat to africa is the solution no alea thoughts yeah i would kind of agree i mean like you know there's this this notion i mean that for me it kind of stinks a little bit of the savior mentality of you know i'm gonna go back and save my people and Truthfully, it robs then us of our complexity. You know, it kind of reduces it to this romantic um, kind of like, yeah, this romantic, almost kind of colonial mentality. Yeah. Every place that, that we yeah. exist in, it's, it's complex. And, and yeah. And also, you know, you do you. Nobody owes you anything. You know, like you look out for yourself because the truth is, um, your your truth and your reality is specific to you. And if you think that your, um, your validation is going to come from somewhere else, whew, that is dangerous. That's just heartbreaking. Can I jump in there? I just can I just I just wanted to give a, a little. So I um, a couple of years ago, um, a, a black American author came to Cape Town for a, one of our book festivals, the Open Book Festival. Um, lovely guy, brilliant writer, um, and he's from San Francisco. And he came to Cape Town, which if you're a South African, you you know that Cape Town is, you know, like the whitest city in Africa. It just isn't. And it, Cape Town is a hugely problematic place. It, it is. And what was really interesting was his his experience of, you know, of what he called Africa. And it was specifically Cape Town. I mean, just even just the, the fact he was saying on his social media, I'm back in Africa. And it's like, dude, Africa is a continent, not a country. Um, and just watching some of his watching some of his social media posts around um, just talking about, oh, and, and there's so many black people here. And just and it was like, yeah, but what you what you don't see, you, you're a tourist. Yes, you might be a black man, and and some of our lived experiences as black people will be the same. But the what you are fundamentally not able to to understand are the nuances of Cape Town, of South Africa, but specifically of Cape Town, because yes, you've gone from being a minority in San Francisco to to being part of a majority um, black population in Cape uh, in South Africa but you don't understand the nuance. You think it's, you know, and he painted this, um, this amazing picture of, I'm in Cape Town and Africa and you know, and he was, he was like wandering through like along the, um, the sort of center of Cape Town. And there were kids, the kids who dress up because they've got no money and they dress up and they perform for the tourists. And he was like, this is amazing, it's Africa. And I was just thinking, dude, you haven't got a clue. You haven't got a clue. And, and then you'll go home to, you know, Oakland or whatever and tell your friends about your, you know, your amazing trip back to the homeland without actually experiencing any of the or appreciating any of the nuance of the reality of what it means to be a black person living in Cape Town. So we can't talk racism without talking about colorism which uh, Peter Nyong'o described as the daughter of racism. Um, Diana, I watched the Skin documentary, which is an awesome uh, film. If you haven't watched it, you should. And in it, you spoke about growing up, you know, hating your skin and having to learn to love it. Um, why do you think that this is such a common story among dark-skinned Black women? I think growing up um, in London and at, from a very young age, you see everyone else praising the light skinned girl, saying wonderful words of affirmation, beautiful compliments, and then you don't get any of that back. So, and you look like the opposite of that. 
So automatically you think you're the opposite of good, which is bad. So you're just surrounded by people praising constantly light skin, fairer skin girls. So you start thinking, okay, so dark skin cannot be a great thing. And even, I think, you know, a friend of mine asked me, we had a conversation about it and she said, do you think it's how you talk to your kids in the home? I think that has a lot to do with it, but your kids will still ultimately go out. They're not home 24 seven. They are ingesting people's thoughts and people's opinions 24 seven. So I think, and those are your formative years of growing. So you adopt these, this negative energy and you have to rebuild. And as you get older, literally strip away the layers of the nonsense and the things that people put on you and also decide what your idea of beauty is and what society's idea of beauty is and which one are you going to follow or try to emulate, so to speak. I think and that Alea, has a to Sorry. Uh, Alea, this isn't something that's just sort of prevalent within the black community. It's obviously something that is ongoing within the Asian and Indian community as well. Um, you know, what, what have you seen or what are your experiences of, of colorism been? Mm. Um, so I remember as a, as a, as a young girl, um, my grandfather used to make this chickpea lemon, a chickpea flour lemon mixture and, um, into this like jar and I'd go out and I'd run around and, you know, come home from sports, you know, with my skin getting darker and he'd, you know, insist that I would scrub my skin to make sure that it got, that I, that, the that, that, that basically that I got fairer. Um, in Gujarati, the word for beautiful is fair. Now, wow. I, I am also, you know, I, on this, if you go to um, Indian, in, in Indian culture specifically, it does have to do with, with it's, it's an economic issue, right? It's not, it's a beauty issue and it's also an economic issue. It's an, it's an issue that touches every part of your life. It, um, it can keep you in a certain box and it can also offer you opportunity that you wouldn't get if you aren't the right skin color. Um, and there's terms for it. You know, you go on, on Indian um, uh, dating websites and they ask you what your complexion is. And Wheatish is a complexion. Um, and basically it's seen as marrying up if you marry someone who's lighter skinned. And so if you are a darker skinned, um, particularly if you're a darker skinned woman, then the the what is what is available to you you're it, 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 you're made to feel as if your world has shrunk not just made to feel your world your world is shrunk you know it, it is an absolute reality and you are reminded that's the other thing like Diana said that you are reminded every minute that you are lesser than and that the world isn't as open to you because you aren't um, the right skin color um, growing up in, in Kenya, the dynamics within individual communities are also very specific. Um, so, of course, it also, you know, ties in with casteism, you know, the, the varying castes. And uh, that, that, that also has a bearing in terms of uh, the hierarchy. I mean, isn't, it all comes down to hierarchy at the end of the day, doesn't it? This idea that of inferiority and superiority. Um, Sarah Jane, in your book, um, you spoke about there being a right kind of brown and a wrong kind of brown when you were growing up in Surrey, which I found really interesting. You spoke about these young girls from Mauritius and they were considered the right kind of brown. They had this flowing hair, this sort of complexion, and you uh, were considered the wrong kind of brown. Um, but I guess in South Africa and in maybe in some other spaces in the UK, you would be considered the, the right kind of brown. So what what's it like kind of navigating all those different types of, of spaces? What's been important for me is to kind of reconcile those two positions of being, or three positions, I guess, of being the, the kid who compared to her white friends was of dark skin and was dark skin and was always unattractive and then uh, becoming the kind of you know the light skin chick with the long hair and then and then coming back to South Africa and there being a whole issue around colorism and and what it means in terms of race here and, and again kind of harping back to a part of classification but also owning my own privilege as a light skin black woman has been quite um 
quite eye-opening for me and I think I was in denial of it around for quite a long time kind of being like yeah but we're all black women together and it's like yeah but your lived experience Sarah Jane is not the same I don't know how embarrassing is that I really did I did it was that it was that I had a blind spot about it um and again it's come back to that thing of I didn't want to be uncomfortable and, and nobody likes to lose their privilege um and now I and it took a few of my um sure of my friends to kind of call me out and be like but you do realize that your experience is not the same as people don't look at you and, and treat you in the same ways that they treat us and I thought yeah I need to own that and, and to not do that is just the height of ignorance and and um yeah but but I, but I think the other thing was was an I don't know if we've spoken about this but the I where where does it come from when I, when I was younger people saying white people would be like, yeah, and I just don't understand, you know, the colour blind people would be, I just don't understand it because we, we we want to make our skin darker and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, but what you are failing, what you do when you say that is you fail to understand what this is all about. And it is about proximity to whiteness. That's the point. That's the crux of it. And yeah. not whiteness, but the idea of whiteness, the societal problem of whiteness and the idea of light skin colorism wouldn't exist if there wasn't this idea of proximity to whiteness and whiteness being held up as the you know the the oracle um i think that's a really interesting point that you said about sort of owning your privilege um i know as a dark-skinned woman and i've heard other dark-skinned women say sometimes speaking about colorism can get quite awkward because Sometimes it looks as though, you know, you're either trying to center yourself or you come across as angry or you come across a, a certain way. Um, how would you say that, you know, like what what's that process like of, sort of owning your privilege? It's difficult because I think, oh God, and now, and now I feel like I'm centering, but. You know, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, I think it's, I've never even, it's rare that I hear a fair skin person say, I have a privilege because I am fairer and I've owned it. I understand the power it comes with. And moving forward, let's be in this together. Like, so kudos to you because it, it is a rarity. You know, and, and I think that, that, that honestly comes from, from the people that I surround myself with who are prepared to call me out. And I'm not sure that I would have come to the realization and come to the acceptance of that at the point at which I did if I didn't, if I wasn't around certain people. Um, because again, and it comes back to that thing of don't like being uncomfortable, don't want to lose the benefits of my privilege, because I there are benefits of my privilege, because one which is that I get to be the black girl in the room, but but the way that you interact with me as the black girl in the room is different to the way that you would, you know, and it, it's it's a messed up type of privilege. It's not always um, a, a, a fun privilege or a, it's, it's just a, I'm not being treated as badly as I might be um, type of privilege. That That's the privilege that it, in some senses that it is. And in other, in, in other ways, it's, it's other things. Um, so you know, it reminds me of this thing like when when Meghan Markle married married Harry, and everyone went, "Oh, a black woman in the in the royal family." And there was this huge there was this huge deal about it, and I was like, "Yeah, but not really," because <laughs> because for, for, for a number of reasons. In the if if Meghan Markle was. Um, I don't know, Tandeka or Chalisa from the Eastern Cape in, in, in South Africa wouldn't be quite the same reception. Or if or if she was um if like, Meghan Markle had know, my she, complexion. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Let me let, uproar. Let me but it wouldn't be there wouldn't be because it wouldn't have even happened. But in a million years, and we, we have to be realistic yeah. about that. In a million years, Harry would not have married somebody, Diana, with your complexion. He would never. And I'm sticking my neck out on the line and, and saying that. It would never have happened. It would um, never. So, again, and it's, it's Meghan Markle's proximity to whiteness. Um, and, and so, yeah, I have to I have to check myself a, a lot around that because it can be, other, you know, although it's not my intention to, to, to make the most of my privilege, attention, intention becomes irrelevant. Um, and if I'm not acknowledging that the, the fact that the people that I call my sisters are having an entirely different lived experience as black women than I am, then that just makes me, you know, 
that's not cool. That's not the kind I of life that we have. Do you know what privilege you have? I, I don't think anyone should not use their privilege or not. Like, it's yours. It's what you look like. It's who you are. It's, I think for me, and the, which is why I love this, is the idea that you understand your power and your privilege. Listen, if you're going to get something because you I get very few privileges to be in dark, but there's a few of them. But I'm just like, it's a reality. So it's fair to say that you can use your privilege. What it is is the idea of people being aloof or, or, or none the wiser to the privilege and then feeling attacked when people bring it up. So I think even mm. your willingness to have your friends call you out and for you to take that on and say, okay, I'm gonna sit here, digest this, take this in and see how we can, like as you said, your fellow black sisters having a different experience. There are some people that choose to not even acknowledge that. You want to sure. befriend people of a darker hue of skin. You're gonna have to entertain some drama, but what that comes with. So I just think it's, it's the ownership and it's the maturity levels to say, I have a privilege. If I can make this privilege work for all of us, okay. But I'm also, mm. I, I know I have it though. And that's okay to have it and to use it. It's be aware. Mm. 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 I, saw you, I saw you nodding along. Are you in agreement? Yeah, I think, I mean, definitely as, um, as, as a woman of color, but as of a different race, um, particularly in Kenya, um, I have a lot of privilege. I, I was born with it. I continue to have it. My, um, and it's often not acknowledged, um, particularly within the Indian community. Um, instead of this acknowledgement of privilege, there's a victim narrative that's at play. Um, and I think the question I'm really asking myself is what am I using my privilege for? Um, and how am I using it to, to change the structures at play? Um, and I am grateful for the ways in which um, I echo Sarah Jane. I, like for me, I'm all, I'm I'm called out often, and I'm grateful for that because because of, intention is like she said, intention is a material. It doesn't matter, you know, um, what you had hoped for. What are you actually doing? Um, so yeah. Um, thanks for all those points. Amazing points. Um, I, just, I find it interesting that when the issue of colorism is brought up, a lot of the times it's sort of spoken about in terms of attractiveness or like, you know, the centering sort of the male gaze, but we all know it goes a lot deeper than that. And, and in the documentary, Diana, you spoke really movingly about how it sort of impacted you in terms of getting work here in Nigeria, which, um, you know, some people would think is nuts because, you know, everyone's black here, but colorism is such a massive issue. And, you know, you you were, you know, it was such a moving part where you said there was, you know, the director was sort of pressurizing you to, to lighten your skin and it just became so much for you that you decided to just move back to the UK. So like, can you tell us a little bit about that experience? So I originally had no plans of moving to Nigeria. I knew that there was a thriving industry, but I like certain things. I like constant electricity. I like certain things I just wasn't willing to budge. And I just, I wasn't ready, but then I changed my kind of work tactic. I was like, do you know what? Wouldn't it make sense to go and work in a country where they all look like you? So what's the issue? Like at the end of the day, it's, it would be based solely on talent because it's not about, oh, the fairer skin, the darker skin, the white, it's, we're all black. So I moved. I, to, till today, have never felt more black than when I lived in Nigeria. I didn't realize I was this dark skin until I moved to Lagos, Nigeria. And I was completely taken aback by the behaviors. I, I remember I, I went to the market. This was maybe like the first month I was living there. And, you know, in true respectful fashion, someone called me over. I kneeled down and said, yes, yeah. hi, auntie. She said, oh, I have a gift for you. Already I was a bit like, okay. And she said, I'll give you the first month for free and then the rest you'll pay for. It was bleaching cream. And when I tell that story, people are like, you've got to be kidding me. I said, no, I was offered bleaching cream because she said, you'd be so much prettier if you bleached. And then I'm entering this industry and people are being so brazen about it. You have lighting guys telling you, okay, I'm struggling to light you. So I don't know how you plan on making this work. You have directors that were saying, I would hire you, but 
you might be a diff you might be difficult to deal with when it comes to post and editing. To me, I was like, um, that's an issue for you guys. You don't know your work. You're not skilled in your area of work. But mm. it grates on you because every single time you go on set, you know that you're not wanted there. If you get a job, it's really because they love your talent, but your aesthetics do not work. And some people just say, okay, fine, let's give it a go. And for me, in 2016, I just said, why would I continue to stay somewhere that first of all, go where you're appreciated, go where you're loved, go where you're respected, go where you're wanted. And I think that industry, um, and things have changed in recent times, but for me, I just, I didn't want to be somewhere that I'm having to force you to appreciate or respect me. And we're, we're all, we're in a black, predominantly black country. And there is just, there is a, a hierarchy. There really is. If you are dark skin, and then there's shades of it as well. I'm of a darker, darker hue, whereas there's the people that are of a lighter brown, a caramel. There's so many different nuances to it. But I think it ultimately, I didn't think I was this dark skin till I moved to Nigeria. But you have to also decide, you know, are you gonna let it, you know, change your mindset? Are you gonna push through? Are you gonna this? Are you gonna that? But it comes down to the same thing. If the mindset doesn't change, do you stay? And how much of a mindset can you change? Like, what do you do? Because this is brainwashing. Mm -hmm. The fact that you're telling me, if I'm lighter, I will marry sooner. If I'm lighter, I will be richer. Like, it sounds stupid, but it's actually quite true. Do you think that there's an awareness, and this is to sort of all of you, do you think that there's an awareness of how pervasive the issue of colorism is on the continent? Do we know how bad it is that, you know, people like Diana are being put in positions in a predominantly black country where they're being told that they're not good enough? Is there a, is there a sharp enough awareness of how deep this thing runs? Uh, let's start with the layout. I think, um, Definitely in the cities, you know, it, it, it is definitely something that you experience every moment of your life. I mean, you know, what jobs you get access to. Um, I mean, the media have, a, and the media are, are, are perpetrators of this. You know, there's this control on your imagination over what, what is visible. You know, as someone who is a darker hue, you are invisible from the national like consciousness when it comes to TV when it comes to the news presenters, when it comes to advertisements, it's like you don't exist. And then you go into offices and for sure, you know, you are, um, the, you are definitely being judged. I think it's perhaps possibly less so up country in the rural areas where um, perhaps within communities, but you know, I, can't, I actually can't answer that because I don't know. Um, what I can answer is the cities, um, and I would be curious to know what the experience would be like in 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 the rural areas. Um, and yeah, they get quite quite um, quite heated. And and again, I think it's that thing of um, people's uh, people's awareness and willingness to acknowledge that they acknowledge as a light skinned person. The idea around colorism and and the and the problems with it are, remain continue to be perpetuated in in our media. So I mean, it's not unless you're completely blind, unless you're a clinical moron, you can't but see um, that there are the the messages that we that we receive around what is accept what is acceptable um, and better than. Yeah, it's but yeah. To, to answer your question very definitely it is a very definite issue that gets discussed a lot in South Africa. Diana, your experience? I, it's either an aloofness, but I think people don't believe it's real. I do, I, I'm going to speak for Nigeria because I don't want to speak for all of Africa, but I'll definitely speak for Nigeria. I think that there is a minority group of people that are severely affected and believe it. But when the majority tells you this is the norm, that's where they follow. It is a herd and, it, it, and it's its leader. So I, I believe majority people believe it doesn't exist. What they do believe exists is aiming to be closer to whiteness. So that's where your greatness lies. 
So that's what they believe. So there's no thing about colorism. So they, they don't see it as a bad thing to want to be lighter than what you currently are. So you can't think colorism is bad or exists when your aim in life is to be lighter skinned. So I, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I don't think it's, it's something they think is a current problem or so I don't see it changing. You don't see it changing. That was my next question. Oh, a lot of changing. Because uh, Sarah Jane mentioned this sort of renaissance, and I guess we're seeing it around the world, this renaissance of like, you know, black pride. We're seeing lots of people, I mean, in, in, in as a sort of reaction to a lot of the distress that we've been seeing, we're seeing people trying to regain their black identity and, you know, really, you know, be black and proud. And, and you know, we've seen a lot of this with, you know, famous people like Beyonce and so on, the whole brown skin girl movement. Are we seeing anything really change uh, on a real sort of level? Hmm. I feel like it's a fashion statement. Right. And, and I feel like everyone's jumping on board of this thing that's happening. It's like, oh, dark skin is so great. Black is so great. This is so great. Keep, there has been dark skin people. Black people been around. What are you confused about? This is, it's a fashion statement. Just like culottes, just like platform shoes, it will go out of style. It feels like, it just feels like the thing to jump on board. Dark skinned women right now are some of the, are one of the most over-sexualized human beings. And that is because it's a fashion statement. It's seen as sexy and exotic now. So now they put sexy and exotic on, that's why you can be dark skinned now, because you're seen as exotic, because you're a different, you're an other, but it's still an other. So how do we change things? How do, what do we do? I think we just need to work on our, our idea and an honest, real, rooted idea of standards of beauty. We're still relying on the world to tell us what is beautiful. That is a problem. We're still relying on the Western world to tell us what is beautiful in Africa. Like, I think it was Leia that said we were colonized, we got rid of them, yet we still move mad. <laughs> Sorry for lack of a better word. We Leo? decide what's beautiful. Yeah, we do move mad. And also, <laughs> and also, I mean, I mean, I don't know what really Dana said it so powerfully. Mm. I think what is what is changing though is that we have control over our images in a way that perhaps we didn't have before. And that feels like it's changing things. Um, if when you have charge over how you want to be seen in the world, um, there is something that, that comes with it that, that, that is powerful. Um, as to, I'm thinking about this idea of an accessory, you know, of this idea of you wear it because it's fashionable, and uh, of this idea of, um, particularly in Kenya we suffer from, if it, it, once, once the West has acknowledged it as, as beautiful, then us too. Oh, it is now beautiful. But I will say when you look at the hair movement, you know, the natural hair movement, um, more and more it is unusual to see uh, people in Nairobi, uh, more and more women are choosing to wear their hair the way they wish. Um, and that's something that is very visible in the city everywhere. You can see how much that's changed in five, even in five years. And I think it does come down to the choice, the fact that um, the, the repercussions. You should be able to move in the world the same way anybody else moves in the world. That's what it comes down to. Period. Yeah. Um, Sarah Jane, anything to add? How do we fix this issue when it comes to colorism? I think it's probably more about, um, it's about representation, I guess. Um, you know, when I was, uh, and to something that that Diana had said around the the messages that she was given as a as a as, um, you know, and I think there's also a generation like probably our parents' generation is perpetuating this also, um, and I think it's probably now up to us um, to kind of uh, redress the balance and change the narrative around it. I think it comes down to representation. I think it comes down to the images of the people that we are seeing in our books in our t on our TV screens. Um, you know, there's a lot of controversy around this Oscars inclusivity thing, but I mean, it's it's about it's about who are we seeing? Are we seeing ourselves represented as 
valuable, smart, intelligent um, people the right way or the good way or whatever. Thank you so much, ladies. Uh, I've just been told that we have run out of time. Thank you guys so much for all your comments. It was amazing to hear from you, all your thoughts. Just a fantastic session. Thank you so much. If you ever need a new place to go, you can join me in the world of words. Let me see like I know where to be found If you look, you'll find me in a book Let's take a ride to the past In the back of a phoenix Let's float around the moon You'll never be alone Now you know where to look Find me, find you, find the world We don't just think of ourselves as a bank, uh, we think of ourselves as corporate citizens with responsibility for growing the economy. Reading and education is a key part of it. But equally important is having access to reading materials uh, at home. A lot of the intervention we've done throughout this COVID is to ensure that people can safely navigate the uncertainties of the COVID crisis and come out of it ready for, you know, to leave again. Let's take a ride to the past in the back of a phoenix. Let's float around the moon. The dreams that we have are limited by what we have directly interacted with. What reading does is it makes it possible for you to begin to live in worlds that don't yet exist. One read creates a discipline of reading. One read puts me on a timeline. It gives me an important book and I have an opportunity to read it and to collaborate. It's almost like having someone who does your book selection for you. If you have editors and people who are really good at this saying to you, this is the book for the month, I, I value that. I want to be able to read in a community. I want reading to be a collaborative thing. I want reading to be a communing and one read allows me to do that. I will use one read any day, any time. Stranger's Guide is not a typical American travel magazine. Our mission is to dive deep into a single location, commissioning work from great writers and photographers famous individuals, as well as up-and-coming new voices. This year, we decided to go to Lagos. And we are proud of the volume we produced, with original work from some of Nigeria's best writers and photographers, working with luminaries like Wale Soinka, Molara Wood, and Femi Kute. We think this is a very special volume, and we're so excited to bring it back to Lagos. Shut you!